Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm the interviewer for the Veterans History Project. And this interview is being conducted on behalf of the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library at 9th and Main Street in Cincinnati, Ohio. Today we have the honor to interview Gil Stalin, a veteran of the United States Army Air Corps during World War II. And this interview is being conducted at his home at the Lodge on Montgomery Road. Uh, and uh, okay to refer to you uh, as Gil or? Yes, yeah, yes, 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 indeed. Uh, uh, Gil, if you would, we get some uh, bio biographical background first before we talk about your military service. Uh, when were you born and where were you living when you were born? Well, that's a good question, though. <laughs> I know. Well, I was born in Hamilton County, of course, Peach Grove, Ohio. Think about that. Peach Grove is out Mount Healthy Way. And it was up on a farm. And I was uh, living with my grandpa, my mom and my dad, with my grandpa, an old German from, from Germany. Anyhow, that's where I was born. And the picture of the house is here someplace. What were the dates of your birth? 1924. What uh, month and year, day? November 1, 1924. I see. 24. Right. And that's when it all happened. <laughs> and then I run to, uh, I lived there for, uh, I don't know, a short time. Because we, my dad had a place down in Taylor's Creek down here towards Miami Town. And he built a house down there, which I have a picture of right there in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a carpenter, same as his brother. And Uncle John being the butcher. So it was three cut-ups in the family. We we're always in the cutting business. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, uh, yeah, I got lived out there until World War II started, and I was drafted, and uh, uh, I- Excuse me, before we get to that, what, what were your parents' names? Your mom oh, and dad? Oh, Ed and Liz, Ed and Liz Stalin. And your mother's maiden name? Was Siebert, S-E-I-B-E-R-T. Siebert. It was Liz Siebert, and they was from the farm. And anyhow, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, and you mentioned that uh, you were living with your grandfather also at uh, at uh, Parlor... Peach Grove? Yeah, uh, Peach, Peach Grove, right? Peach Grove? Yeah. What was his yeah, name? It was uh, Siebert Nicholas. Nicholas Siebert. I he was see. from Germany. Come I from see. Germany. I remember him telling me he stowed away on a big boat. He, sto he st hid someplace in the storage room, and he made it over here. That's the way he got started. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, uh, we didn't live with Grandpa long because we have gotten our own home down there in Taylor's Creek, which is down off of Harrison, P Harrison Pike. And uh, Daddy built the house, which I have a picture of here. and. Uh, uh, he was a carpenter. So anyhow, we farmed down there, had a little only 10, 12 acres, something like that, which is still down there on the hillside, but we raised pigs and cows and milk cows. And we had a regular little farm, and my mom was a farm girl, so she baked all the bread and she made all the food, and we had a, a trip that we'd go into Cheviot with the back of our old Chevrolet. We'd take the back uh, seat out of the car, I remember, and go up through Cheviot and sell. We had, oh, eggs and butter and sour cream and fresh butter all the time. And corn on the cob. We'd go down to the neighbor and steal. I mean, buy some of his corn, <laughs> and but we'd sell it and make money. That's mm -hmm. the way we made a living. But anyhow, mom was a good old farmer. Daddy would be in the carpenter. But we milked the cows all the time. The girl, my brother, and my sister. Anyhow, we. We had a good old life. We never was hungry. Yeah, I remember when Mom used to make our clothing because we didn't have any money, so she'd try to make our shirts, my boy, my brother and I, and she'd make it out of them old s feed bags. We used to get feeds, 100-pound bags, I guess, corn, cornmeal, and stuff like that. We fed the cows. 
And she said, that looks awful nice. So she'd take it and cut it up and make those shirts. My brother and I, we said, dang, going mad. Had to go to school with that on, you know? Yeah. But anyhow, we made it. Speaking of schools, where did you go to school? Oh, out there in, uh, hell, it still stands. Pleasant, uh, Pleasant. The, uh, St. Ber Bernard's Parish down there on Harrison Avenue, down towards Miami Town. She still stands. Still, school is still there. Is that where you went to grade school? Yeah, yeah, that's where I graduated from. Oh, in high St. school? St. Bernard's. High school also? No, I only went to Corrine High School one year. And I figured out, I just wasn't cut out for that business. I like doing something with my hands, not my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyhow, I was, the story goes on and on. But anyhow, uh, by that time, uh, I got told that I was going to be put into civil service, I think was the name of it. Civil service was government, I guess. But anyhow, I had been put in Dayton, Ohio, Dayton Airfield, which is great now today. And I was a mechanic. Oh, no, I was a mechanic. I, was, I helped put gas in airplanes, crawl up on them wings, put the gas in the wing, you know, fill it up. Anyhow, I thought, hmm, it's pretty cold up there. Man, it was cold up there on them wings, you know, filling that cold gas. But anyhow, what, what I... What were you working for, the government? Or yeah, the civil my, in my civil service, yeah. Uh, right out of high school or while you were in high school? Yeah, well, I quit high school. Oh, okay. So then I was put into sir, uh, service, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this civil service, was it? Was that the three C's? No. Uh -uh. No. Okay. But anyhow, it served me well until the Army got me at 18. I guess I worked there for a year or more. And my dear friend and I had a sleeping room up in Dayton, Ohio. Oh, Al Belton. Al Belton. I wonder what happened to him. But he quit and went to the seminary. He turned out to be a priest. I remember that. Anyhow, that was when I was 17, going on 18. And that's when I got enlisted and I had to go to Cheviot and was drafted. That's when I got away from them cows. Uh. <laughs> so I had to get away from them cows, man. I look at that milk every day and I think, damn, somebody milked those cows. But now they got electric milkers. Yeah. I told my mom, I said, why didn't you get these electric milkers when my brother and I was at home? She says, honey, I didn't need electric milkers in because you guys had then all the milking. I said, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of getting drafted, uh, that brings up the next question. Uh, uh, do you remember when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December the 7th? And yeah, yeah. I wonder wh where you were and what were you doing then? Yeah. Pearl Harbor. Hmm. I guess I was still in New York or. I guess I wasn't over there then, was I? No, I was uh, still here in the States. Yeah, you weren't in the service yet. I yeah, mean. I was in Long Island, New York. Well, you're, well, I you're, went in in 43. Yeah, uh, Pearl Harbor Day was uh, in 41. Okay. You must have been, you were still working at... Uh, 41? Yeah, December the 7th, 41. Hmm. Yeah, they went in the service in 43 then. Right. Huh? Oh, yeah, I was still... Up in Dayton, right, right field, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But anyhow, it was quite an experience for a country boy. And uh, I'm proud of it. Oh, yeah. So you got your uh, draft notice, yeah. is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got a real fancy letter, like I told you before. You have now been selected to serve the United States as a as serve in the army, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, praise the Lord. Get away from these cows. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where did you go down to be sworn in at? Cheviot. Right there in Cheviot, Westwood. Was a draft. And uh, damn, these guys. Oh, man, I'll tell you. I thought, this is awful. All these guys, you know all leaving home. Some of them was crying, you know, and some was happy like me. <laughs> 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 uh, 
But anyhow, yeah, it was quite a few guys went in that day in May 19 and 20, what did I say, 1942? 40. 42, I guess, 43, huh. Yeah. Uh, so then they send us to Gulfport, Mississippi, I think, for my basic training, which was hot. Damn, it's hot down there. But anyhow, I had a, had a big kick out of these guys that was big like you guys. Sweating, you know, and us little skinny guys. Hell, I only weighed 146 pounds, I think, when I went in. Didn't bother me, but the big guys, they'd faint like, die like that, just fall all over. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, the heat was too hot down uh -huh. there. What was the name of that base down there in Gulfport? Gulfport, Mississippi. I don't remember that. It was called Fort Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But it was a base where we all got our basic training and got activated, I think they called it. We right. was activated then. And that means you was put into a service of Navy, Army, or Air Force, but they happened to put me in the Air Force. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. I'd rather be there than walking. So anyhow, anyhow it worked out good for me. So I end up with a nice bunch of guys from Pennsylvania and New York. Our first sergeant, big tall like you or taller, hell of a guy. We used to stand and watch him type. I never saw a man type. Well, back in the 40s, typing was quite a thing. But that guy could type so fast, and he could type the morning report was a narrow piece of paper that went down charts, you know. Took our name and all we put on it. But he could hit that thing and type and hit that thing and hit that thing. But he was fast. He used to like to show off and show us how fast he could type. Mm -hmm. Big tall guy, nice guy. Everybody loved him. But one or two that would go AWOL, you know, when we was over in Europe. They'd go out, get drunk, and wouldn't come back. And he'd be hard on us. Well, yeah. And then they wouldn't like him. I right. said, well, what? I thought, why would you get mad at him? You're the guy that did you the guy that made the trouble, you know. We had guys, I tell you, they was characters. Mm. So what was your training down there? Was you with the rifle or? Uh, no. no. Well, we had carbines. Uh-huh. The carbine, yeah, it was a the small, It had yeah. one of these, uh, yeah, it was a carbine is all I right. remember. But yeah, we was all, uh, I guess, got one as a soldier and we got the learn how to take it apart, clean it, not sleep with it. <laughs> Some guy said, I think I'll sleep with mine. But anyhow, we learned how to take care of the gun. That was part of the service, I guess. But anyhow, it ended up that I ended up in the orderly room. And that's how I got to be the mailman. I got to help the mailman. <laughs> that's where the story started when, when I was the mailman. We was over in Europe, and these guys say, Sarge, did you, well, how about my mail from yesterday? I said, oh, it could be in your box. We had a big box with A, B, C, and D, and you know, pigeonholes. And I'd put them in there. And if you didn't get any mail, you didn't get any mail. Well, why didn't they get mail? I said, did you ride home lately? No. Well, it's your fault. Oh, some of those dumbest skunks, you know. <laughs> right, right. Anyhow, uh, uh, sometimes they next day go by and did you bring the mail? I said, yeah, I just took the Jeep, went out and got three bags. But I said, you know, coming across that bridge back there, it was stormy, the wind was blowing, and I think one of them bags fell off. And it could have been one of your bags, one of the bags that your mail was in. Damn, what are you going to do? I said, let it float. <laughs> well, it ain't fair, you know, they get mad at us, and then right. I'd laugh. I said, no, I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> so they never did believe anything I said, and I told them I lie all the time. <laughs> So you got, uh, uh, you were assigned to the orderly room at right after basic? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was really lucky. Yeah. Because I got privileged character, you know, I had a Jeep that I could use. I got a picture of the Jeep right there. I was just showing yeah. the guys before, you used right. three Jeeps. And uh, I had a carpenter from Dayton, Ohio, George Allen. He says, Gil, you know, it's cold over here. I said, yeah. I said, going after the mail, man, couldn't you put a cloth or something on the side? He says, I'll fix you up. So there's a picture in that book yeah, he built where he closed in my Jeep mm -hmm. and had doors on the side, you know. And anyhow, uh, 
boy, it was all, it was a really dirty, ugly Jeep. You saw a picture of that Jeep full of mud? Now, well, we was all in Germany, I think, by that time. Where did you, when you first left the United States, uh, or after basic, what was your next place to be stationed? Here in this From country here. or overseas? Hmm. Long Island, New York. I was in Long Island, New York, I think, right before I shipped out. Because mm -hmm. that was my first love right there. Oh, I mean, <laughs> some girl I used to, us guys, we all had girlfriends, you know. Because we, we told them, I said, this might be our last, you know, for tomorrow we might be dead. That's what we used to call them in their service. They used to cry. We go over in France. We used to tell these girls, let's dance. Let's, we used to have a dance. We'd be dancing, having a ball, drinking that. Vive la Paris, I think they used to say. God bless Paris. Drinking that wine, you know. And I said, you've got to have a good time because, you know, tomorrow we might get shot. Oh, don't say that. The girls would just don't <laughs> talk like that. They used to cry. <laughs> uh, Cause some guys, they get killed. <laughs> but no, our airplane pilots, them poor son of a bucks. Man, we had guys come in here 22, 23 years old, just out of college, learn how to fly in that big son of a buck in airplane. And they'd leave, and they'd leave me with their wallets and their watches. No, they had an army watch but they're civilian watches, and I was responsible as a mailman to keep their privates like that. But boy, some days they wouldn't come back. Got shot down and killed. And I thought, damn, I can't believe that. I was just talking to him. Here he's dead. Mm -hmm. right. and, uh, do you, uh, we're at in uh, France. Do you recall where you were at in France? France. Uh, France. Uh, France. Belgium. France. Metz. Metz, France. Metz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. M E T Z. Metz was one I remember. Metz, France. You know, I forgot to ask you what squadron uh, that w you were we in. Was, we had three squadrons. You were in the 9th Air Force. That was the 395th Fighter Squadron. <coughs> Colonel Quimby. Who? Cur Colonel Q-U-I Quimby. Colonel Quimby was his name. And he got shot down in Germany, and they took him prisoner. And he was gone for over a year or more while we was over there. And one day I heard that Colonel was picked up in one of them prison camps. Man, I tell you, he was as heavy as that man there or you. And man, when we got him back, he was like a rack of skin and bone. What was his last name again? Quimby. Q-U-I-M-B-Y, I think. Q-U-I-M-B-Y, Quimby? Colonel Quimby. Uh -huh. Oh, he was a major. And when he come back, they made him Colonel. Yeah. Colonel Quimby. He's from New York, I think. A lot of guys from New York, they got a lot of us from New York or from Ohio. Oh yeah, man, it was quite a tour. I enjoyed it. <laughs> they, uh, I, that uh, squadron you were in uh, has been written up quite a bit. It's a pretty famous outfit. 368 Fighter Group, yeah, boy. Yeah. We did all the escorting of all the bombers. We used to fly along with them B-24s up and below them and above them, you know, and go with them. Because we carried five, we carried three bombs. We had a 500-pound bomb, I think, on the belly. It was a big sucker. It was that long. Mm -hmm. And on the wings, we had smaller ones, I think. I right. guess those, they might have been uh, other things than bombs. Rockets. Something like rockets, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a P-47. Yeah. That uh, your squadron had, correct? Yeah, P-47. Thunderbolt. Damn, I had pictures of that here. I should yeah. have. It's in the book there. You yeah. yeah, boy. Huh. So you were flying out of uh, out of France, and then I think you told us once that you, I mean, you told us that you went into Germany also? Oh, yeah. We was in Nuremberg and Frankfurt. Uh, yeah, see, our planes would be flown from England 
to France, and these engineers would come and go out in the field like, and this lay down this big steel muff. It was about 30 inch, I guess, wide, and I guess 20 foot long of steel with holes in it. Mm -hmm. I can still see that because it made noise when they drove across it. But they'd lay that down from here to four, five, six, seven, eight, two thousand feet down that way for them to land on. And they would make a runway within, damn, short week time, I guess, short time. They'd yeah. have it sit up right in a, somebody's cornfield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we'd set up tents out there, which was, I told you, maybe sleeping in them tents was really fun. We'd wake up and we had four, eight, hmm, four or eight guys in a tent. It's a big square job. And it had a hole at the top for your, we had a little pot belly stove. And I remember trying to get somebody to steal us some wood. I don't know why I was a leader. Hell, I was only a, star, a corporal then. On those pictures, I was still a corporal. But anyhow, they'd go out in these guys' places and steal some wood from somebody. <laughs> So it'd keep us warm. Yeah. We'd get that pot belly stove about that big going. It was only about this high. And we'd get that, that chimney going up through that hole. But it'd keep us until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And nobody would get up. We're all sleeping there with our clothes on. We took our shoes off. That's all I can remember taking our shoes off. But we slept with our clothes on. But anyhow, that stove would keep it great until about 3 o'clock in the morning or 4. Buddy, after that, <laughs> it was... I guess in the 20s, I guess. Yeah. Or 30, mm -hmm. maybe 30. Because we'd wake up and we had frost on our nose holes, you know. It was something else. And I felt sorry for some of those guys that was in maybe 29, 30 years old. I mean, that was pretty old to me, being 18, oh, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Damn, I don't know how we did it. Yep. But it was fun. You <laughs> for me. Did you, did you set up, did, did you live in tents while you were in uh, Germany also? In Germany? I, I don't think so. Germany. Germany. I don't know. In some part of the tour, I remember we took over, oh, I got pictures of that. We took up villages like this, not like this, like a village back there. They'd run those people out, and we would move into all those homes. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. And us guys, the old man, or we would call him the old man, but he was just probably a young guy, captain. We right. said, "How about this furniture? You can't sit on. It. Throw it out." I said, "Throw it out there." I said, "It's gonna get wet. Hell with it." We threw it out. Good furniture. I said, "This is terrible." Man, I was wishing I had that when I was home. That's the way I felt, you know. So anyhow, he was the boss. So we end up sitting our cots in there and our tough, our duffel bag, our clothing, and that was it, man. That was our home. But we was in a nice house like this, you know. I thought, well, this, and they had little German cars. I remember I'd got the dry one for a while, but the captain found me. He says, you shouldn't be driving that. You're not an officer. I said, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> but that was another story. I was a Jeep truck. I had a Jeep. To, and the captain says, Sarge, I got to go to Bells and so-and-so. You take me up. I said, you tell me how. So we was going up the road, driving on the left side of the road. You don't drive on the right side over there. Is that England or Bells? That's England. But yeah, we're on the left side. So we was driving one day and he says, hey, Sarge, he said, did you ever drive on the left side of the road before? I said, only when I was drunk. <laughs> but he was a big, tall Texan. I said, no, we'll be all right. So this was funny driving to a kid on the left side of the road, but I picked up on it pretty fast. But I got him where he wanted to go. Were you, were you stationed in England for any time? I guess. England. Now, I don't think we stay in England very long because we spend most of our time in Germany and France. And uh, but England, England, England. Hmm. I have to think England. It's where all the British girls were. 
we were still able to go and dance with them, you know. Crazy Americans, they used to call us. <laughs> yeah. Crazy Americans. We was yeah. always wild, and, you know. Well, I guess. at 18. And yeah. the poor guys from England, those, uh, what do we call them? From England, soldiers, Scottish. They come with their short dresses on, you know. These guys used to make fun of these Scottish. They still right. wear them. Kill the, the bagpipes and all that. Oh, oh we're in trouble. Anyhow, uh, anyhow, uh, yeah. yeah. We had a lot of what we were talking about, the English. Yeah. 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 Um, do you, uh, have you stayed in touch with any of the guys that you were in the military with? Yeah, after about five, ten mm -hmm. years, maybe I did. Uh, Fine. He was from Dayton, much. Ohio. Mm -hmm. I got pictures of that. I visited them up in Dayton, Ohio, one day, and our first sergeant. Uh, yeah, he was staff sergeant. Our first sergeant was a little Italian, I think, little bitty guy. But then he was smart. He was another one could type, boy. He could type. But first sergeant was the best. But we stopped and saw him one day. Remember Helen? Up Dayton one time. Oh, sure. Him and his wife. What was the first sergeant's name? Do you recall that? Calderero, yeah. C A L Calderero. Sergeant Calderero. Can't see his first name right now. Sergeant Calderero. Hell of a nice guy. He was in his thirties, I bet. He was pretty old. Ball headed fella. Uh, you re you remembered Major Quimby, I think. Uh, Major Quimby. Any other officers that were pilots there that you remember offhand? Oh, Captain Montague. Montague? Yeah. Montague. I believe he got shot down, too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, boy. Yeah. And your squadron was flying B P fifty P forty seven. Forty seven. Yeah. The big old thunderbolt. Yeah. I got pictures of that in here too sometimes. And their job was to protect the bombers on the way yeah, into the Yeah, and then target. we did a lot of bomb dropping bombs, strafing. Oh, I forgot. I, but anyhow, what we did over in England, one of the mechanics, the old man, said it was all right. He took the radio controls out behind this P-47 seat, gave us enough room for a little seat, which they took me a ride in. So I got to sit back there, and this, I don't know what he was, an officer flying the plane. He says, Gil, I'll show you what it looks like through this gun sight. So right in front of his face was the gun sight where he could look through that and, and pick up whatever he wanted to shoot at, you know. It was, like, you know, whatever you call a gun thing you shoot, look through, a telescope. So, uh -huh. Anyhow, I stick, he said, going down, going towards this barn. He said, you see that barn down there? Well, he had to talk real loud because there's noisy in there. We'll go for that barn. So we come down, we head for that barn, and boy, he had it right on that barn. And then he got down, I guess, a thousand feet or so and pulled out. And I tell you, your ears felt like your ears come down and it was just, you felt so heavy. Uh -huh. Damn, the weight that you felt when that airplane pulled out like that. So that was quite a night thing for me at 19 years old. <laughs> it was fun. So you, uh, you're in Germany at uh, Nuremberg and Frankfurt, Frankfurt I think. Frankfurt, yeah. Uh, Nuremberg and Frankfurt. Were you there when the war was over in Germany? Yeah. Yeah, when the Germans surrendered there, uh, I was still in Germany, and I was low point man, which means the pilots and the so on got so many points for being doing so kind of service. But me being the mailman and the lower echelon, we called it, didn't have as many points, so they said, you will be sent to uh, Italy. Where is that? Where the other war was? Italy? Yeah. yeah. In Italy. And I said, really? I said, well, I thought it was pretty hot over there. So thinking about the heat, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, we get on this big boat and all these guys that was high points, they was going to be sent to New York. And they bid us farewell. I said, well, we'll see you maybe 
So we get on this big boat, and here we're out on this ocean, and we're going towards Italy. And and uh, here we're out there, I don't know, a day or so, and the captain come on, and he says, now hear this. This is where the, when you heard that, everybody was quiet. Right. He said, now hear this. He said the Germans surrendered. And uh, so did Japan surrendered. So, man, you're on this boat. We'll just take you along to New York. So, man, he just turned. <laughs> Was we lucky or not? Yeah. They took our whole boatload, <laughs> I don't know how many thousand guys, 5,000, imagine was on that right. boat, to New York. And here I am, got in New York, I don't know how I got to Harrison, Ohio, out here so fast. But here I was out in Harrison with my mom and dad, and I says, God, I got to write these guys a letter. So I wrote the sergeant and all these guys that was going to be sent to New York, and me was going to ship Japan, you know. <laughs> I said, it's too bad to give you this good news, but I said, I'm, I'm at home. Uh. So they was mad because I got home. <laughs> Before they did, huh? Shoot. Um, so what? anyhow, I got home and served the rest of my time. I don't know where I went after that. I have to think about that. Did you, hmm. uh, did you go to Camp Atterbury or? Yeah, you know, that's where I got out. Yeah. Yeah, Camp Atterbury. I don't know how long I was there, but Camp Atterbury is where I was discharged. Yeah. Right. You you remember pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of guys got mustered out there at Atterbury. They lived around the Midwest area. Um, yeah. When do you recall when you got discharged from the military? May third, nineteen and twenty-five. Four, sure. four, five, six, forty-five. May the 3rd, 1945. Does that sound right? 46 Isn't sounds it? better. 46? Hmm. 43, 43, 44, 45. May the 8th, yeah. May the 8th. No, I don't know. I think it was 45. Um, Seemed like it was 45, but late October, I think. It was um, October oh. 45. Yeah, October, so, yes. Yeah, October. it was almost right. 46. Because you were there when uh, Germany surrendered and you were in when Japan surrendered. Yeah, I was on the boat when Japan right. surrendered. Right, so it, was, it would have been October 45. Yeah, yeah. 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 Damn. Now, what did you do after you got discharged from the military? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I met my wife, Helen. Uh, oh, I found out that, man, we could make $90 a month. That was a lot of money. Doing what? Going to school. I went down to VA. Oh, damn, then I found out I had toothache one day, and I met a dentist down there, and that son of a buck pulled my teeth out. Big old doctor, you get down and pull that, get that pliers and pull it out, you know. But anyhow, that's another story. He pulled some of my teeth. It's down on Fifth Street. I remember that in one of them big tall buildings. You know, as country boys get down to the city and start looking up at them big buildings, that's amazing. Yeah. To think how big they are and now right. they're bigger than that. Right. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, that was where I was down there, and uh, and uh, well, I thought I had a v GI l uh, availability, and I didn't have any s education of any kind. So I says, I think I'll go to, oh, my aunt always was one who's always had a pretty good head of hair, and my mom did too, had real wavy hair. And I used to do my mom's hair once in a while uh, when I was down on the farm. Maybe I was brushing or combing it and stuck with her. She said, Gilly, she called me Gilly, you should learn to be a hairdresser. I said, hmm, really? Yeah. Well, see them little wheels start rolling, and you think, hmm. Everybody's got hair. Almost everybody. <laughs> My son-in-law sitting back there. But anyhow, I thought, damn, that's a good idea. They're going to pay me 90 bucks a month? Well, that's more money than I, well, I don't know what I got in the Army. I got more than that, I guess. 
But anyhow, I went down to Fifth Street down there, Moeller High School, Moeller Barber College, mm -hmm. and talked to him. He says, Gil, we can work you in, but he said, the barber school is filled up. How about you, uh, we got a beauty school we own. Oh, that's the way it was. I went to the beauty school first, but I wanted to go to barber school, but it was filled up. At least the, I was going to get 90 bucks. What? I'll take it, you know. Right. So I went to the beauty school and finished up. That's where I met my wife. <laughs> and the school teacher says, he told my friend Harry and me, he looked at us, an older man. He said, listen, you two, I know you're stiff. <laughs> Just come out of the service, 21, 22, you know. He said, this is a place of education. I said, yes, sir, we hear you. And not a place of romance. Yes, sir. <laughs> We were both dating then. <laughs> <laughs> he, he married his wife from there. <laughs> well, <laughs> well. I told her. <laughs> I told her. I said you shouldn't, shouldn't talk to me like that. All this love stuff, you know. So anyhow, I got a job, as well as going to school, down at. Crew tire building, parking cars. Mm. That's another story. <laughs> cars would pull in and still there, down underneath the crew tire. Right. Go down in there, and that's where I got my start. Harry and I used to park cars down there after barber school. And the girls, his wife and I, Helen used to come and meet us down there. After t we got off at 10 or 11, I guess, we'd go up to Frisch's or White Castle, and that was a big deal back in the 40s, you know. Right. White Castle. And uh, till 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, you know. But anyhow, uh, that's the way we spend our time, at it, eating out at White Castle or something. But anyhow, he married from there, and then they married Helen. Oh, he's in beauty school, though. And that's when the teacher told me, this is no place of panky tank or panky tank or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I hear you. Because him and I were both 21 years old, man. We was ready for anything. But anyhow, uh, we both got a job down there. Oh, and what I want to tell you, this guy come in there with a brand new Oldsmobile, I think it was, big 98 O's. And I knew that track was where it was, but I hit that track, it had steel. Oh, it's steel, 10 inches high, steel rack, and that's where you put the wheels into, and then it got that elevator and it took it upstairs. But damn, I got on top of that steel one time and I hit the fender against the wall. Scared the heck out of me, because man, a big fancy uh, right. $8,000 car, I guess at that time, was the best you can buy. Mm -hmm. 7,000, top of the line, you know. Right. But anyhow, I got out of that. Damn, that was something. But I got pictures of that, him and I standing down there, in that book you was looking at. Now when did you and then, you 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 were uh, romantically involved with Helen. When did you and Helen decide to get married? When did you get married? Uh, well, I told her. I said, "Now, we shouldn't be doing this. We're only 21 years old, or 22 maybe, 23. Well, we got married at 24. Yeah, we were 24. We got married. <laughs> hey, Bill, get me a drink, will you please? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and you want something to drink? No thanks. Uh, What'd you ask me? Uh, the date that you folks got. Oh, we got married in 48? Yeah. What was the date? Month and day? Uh, we got married in May. When was it May? Huh? October. October 21 or 20? <laughs> October the 20th, 1948. That's coming up pretty soon. Yeah. Now, what were you doing for a living at that time when you got married? Oh, thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. I'll drink you, my son-in-law. Hmm? What were you doing for a living when you got married? Parking those cars oh, okay. down in the garage, yeah. Big buck. Well, I was getting 90 bucks a month. I was rich, Yeah. you know, from the VA. Right. And he was, too. But we parked cars, so I don't know what we got paid. But we worked for a, the parking situation down there, terminal. That is still there, I guess. 
I went down to visit many years afterwards, and them same old guys were there parking them cars. I thought, damn, well, I was a barber by that time. The easy life, you know. Oops, I didn't. I should when, say when did hard you, work. Uh, uh, when did you start uh, get to go to a barber in school? Because you were in beauty school before and working parking cars. When I met, finished beauty school, I worked at 6th Street, one of the beauty shops at 5th, 5th and 6th, someplace up there. Harry and I both got a job there. And this lady says, sure, we'll be glad to have you. We need help. So here is a beauty shop, one, two, three, four, five chairs, maybe. Harry and I got, of course, the last ones. And everybody would come in. I said to Harry, I said, hey, this is no good. All the women come in, they get those first two, three chairs. I said, it ain't we going to make it. <laughs> so anyhow, I went down and talked to Mr. Darnell, the school owner. He says, yeah, we'll get you in. So him both and I got into barber school then. Uh -huh. So then our pay still kept, you know, we still got our money from VA. And, uh, and we finished, and he opened his own shop out there in Westwood, Cheviot Westwood. And I owned my own in Pleasant Ridge down here, where my shop still is. And uh, <laughs> in that little old house that shows in that book I showed you, $40 a month. He got me for that room. That was mm -hmm. a bunch of haircuts, 40 bucks a month I yeah. had to pay for that room. It was a sleeping room, I think, because it was somebody's bedroom, I guess, at one time. But yeah. It was a beautician that was in there. <laughs> and I was eating it. I got fired. That's another story. Uh, there was a little barber shop there in Pleasant Ridge, and I was d dating Helen then. And I says, this guy needs a... One, I went to the barber union, signed up in the union, and they said, the only thing we got to open is a place in Pleasant Ridge. I said, Pleasant Ridge? Where in the heck is that? I never heard of it. Right. You know, a country boy from Harrison. Well, it's home to me now, you know. But anyhow, I went out there, and big old Jack Bouchart was his name. That sucker was this big around. He says, yeah, I could use a barber. And it's still, no, I think it's, I think they tore the, yeah, I think it's torn down right now. But the building still stands that he was hooked to. But anyhow, I start working there, buddy. I'm telling you, I start making customers. We had more business. And you know, instead of having a chair to sit in, I could, we had stools for cows that was milked out in the barn. Thank God people would come in and sit on them stools waiting for a haircut. Well, he finally put me in the chair number one. He put himself back. We got busy. We got so busy, I finally, we had to hire another guy. What the heck was his name? But we had three guys, three barbers in that little bitty room. It was no bigger than this dining room, this living room. But we had three chairs in there and them, all them stools for them people to right. sit on. <laughs> but we'd done a hell of a business. Mm -hmm. So Christmas Eve come along and I had bought him a pint of whiskey. He was a type of guy that had a family, had two boys, and uh, he was a hobo on the railroad. He used to tell me some good stories. I, he says, man, one time they put a chain, a ball chain, gold bars on him. Chain, a chain and ball, they call it. Yeah. Because he was a bad guy, I guess. Anyhow, he was on the rail railroad there. But anyhow, he was telling me stories, and they got to like the old guy. But anyhow, oh, but when we got all this going on and Christmas come, was we married then, babe? We was married, she come to pick me up, and I said, okay, we're gonna close up. Because I was in chair number one, Bill was in there, and the old man was number, he was against the toilet. <laughs> he was back against the wall. But anyhow, uh, everybody left but me and him. And he looked at me, and I was just gonna go back in the back room, I got him a pint of booze, whiskey. And I was just gonna go back and get him, he said, I'll tell you what. I said, what? He said, I think Monday you better look for a new job. Really? Hmm. So uh, I saw he was serious, you know. Damn. I was thinking about getting married, or was we married? We just got married. 
I thought, dang it, what am I going to do? So anyhow, I said to myself, hmm, I'll just take my barber's sack, my bag. We had bags from school. Got my bottle of whiskey and put it in that bag that he was going to get. Right. <laughs> put my tools on top of it and said farewell. So I went home and I said, what are we going to do? We was renting a nice place there in Pleasant Ridge. And she was working at Shinky Motors. Remember old Shinky selling them Lincoln Mercury's? I think. A hey, bookkeeper. But anyhow, that's the way it goes on and on and God, I tell you. But anyhow, I, that's where I started out. I was having do coffee and donuts one morning right down the block there with Mr. Owen Albers. How about that? Who was that? Owen Albers, who was in there having coffee. He says, what do I hear about you? I said, yeah, I got fired. Can you believe that? He said, I tell you what, in my building there, in that white building I showed you, the beautician just left. He said, the plumbing is in it. Why don't you start a shop? I said, me? Yeah. I said, I'll be damned. Hmm. I said, maybe I could do that. So I asked the barber board, and they said, yeah, as long as you have your barber license and we we'll get the barber inspector out and inspect all the plumbing and everything that is right, and you could start. So there's, there it was. So I got started, and I got cutting hair, and the barber across the street, Joe, Joe Cooper, he was a little Italian. He did all the work. Yeah, everybody went to Joe. But I started getting one every once in a while, you know, getting one here and one there. And I built up to a pretty good business. Here comes, I got so daggone busy that I just couldn't handle it all. Here comes my friend Willis Turner, he rest his soul. I got pictures of him here. He come to me, I said, yeah man, I said, I need a barber. He's standing there in that picture I showed you mm -hmm. outside the shop. So he started with me, and boy, we did a heck of a business. We done a business in that little house. And then one day, after a few years, I heard Mr. Sicky moving the storage across the way. They was taking a, it was a theater, Ridge Theater, and they took all the windows out of the front, or something out, but they put new plate glass in there, and I thought, hmm, boy, that'd be a pretty nice spot, you know. I start thinking, <laughs> my wheels start turning. So I went over to Mr. Sicking, who was Sicking moving in storage. I said, hey, how about that room? Yeah, he said, why don't you move in there? I said, hey, that's a good idea. So I moved in there and had three, four chairs in there. There's a picture in that mm -hmm. book, too, and had yeah. four chairs. And uh, done a hell of a business there. <laughs> Reminds me of a guy, and if one of his kids might be here, Helen, you better get you a drink. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, mean, I got a long ways to go. I mean, <laughs> um, but anyhow. There's something we forgot to, to mention here, though, is uh, your children. Um, Dennis, oh yeah, my twins. I told Helen. How many children I, did you folks have? Four of them. I told Helen when we got married, I said, let's don't have any kids. I said, as far as I know, all they do is dirty their pants and spill milk all over everything. She said, yeah, all right. You know, she's from the country down there in Kentucky. And I said, well, that should work out all right. If I could make 50 bucks a month, you know, or a week, I mean, I could pay for the car and I could pay for a lot of things. So anyhow, I don't know what happened. She got pregnant. I thought, oh, oh, this is bad. She's going to have to quit her job. And the haircuts were only 75 cents. And the union bike out about the same time, they says, you know what? We got a, we got a letter stating that they're going to raise the barber, the par the barber uh, uh, price to a dollar. And I told my friend Willis, I said, damn, a dollar. Man, we're going to get well. He said, yeah, that'll be great. I think he bought a house way up there in Kenwood Road for $12,000 or something. Anyhow, 
we done well. We stayed there and cut hair for a long time. So then I heard that Pleasant Ridge Fifth Third Bank had built a new building right up there next to Pleasant Ridge. And it was a great big house. We called it the Haunted House. It was a great big four-story house with a big tube below and everything on top. But anyhow, we used to call it the Haunted House. But as businessmen, we poured chalk shingles. I don't know where we got all them shingles around this building so people could park there. We needed parking. So anyhow, uh, they must have torn that build. But anyhow, Fifth Third come along for standard building loan. They build a new building in there. And in my eyes, you know, saw that new building, that new front door and all that. I thought, damn, that'd be nice. Be close to the bank, you know. So that's when I made my next big move. I moved out in that building, which you got pictures of there. So I was in that building until I got some money saved up. Then I looked at that building up the way there, that one with the four stores in I showed you in that book, yes, the mm -hmm. four store. This Otto, he was from Germany. I don't know where Otto was from, German. He might have been German. But uh, I got in there, and he had a room. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, you got a room. You move in there. So I moved in there, and it was a, used to be a delicatessen. The floor was all rotted out from the cold box sit there. And my dad, being a carpenter, he said, don't worry about it. He says, I'll fix that floor. He says, you worry about the electric and all that, you know. So my friend's electrician did the work. But anyhow, I went in, I bought that building for, I don't know, 79 nine or something like that, which I sold later to my son-in-law. I got rich because I paid, I charged him more. He bought it after I had it. <laughs> <coughs> I gave him a deal, didn't I, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I kept that building for, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years. Yeah, it was a long time. I kept Is that, that where you retired from? Uh -uh. So then Bill wanted a building, and I was ready to move again. I get, I'm like a gypsy. I want to move every couple of years. So anyhow, I sold the building to Bill, my son-in-law, Bill Young. I said, Bill, I got this what you need, because he always had money. He's rich. <laughs> So anyhow, I gave him a deal. I sold him the building, and I says, I found a place down there right around the corner by the hitching post. It's a little building sitting empty. I'm going down there Sunday and look at it. It had a for sale sign on it. Used to be a hitching post. You remember? Sure. You're too young. Hitching right, post was sure. a little restaurant, mm -hmm. coffee and donuts. And but then I took that number and I called that lady. I says, mm. so anyhow, I end up looking at that building. I says, I'll take it. I think I bought that for 84 9 or something like that. But anyhow, I took that and remodeled that sucker, man, and that's where I finished up. That's where my shop is now after 22 years it's been in there, which my son is running now. And all my bar, my one barber, I got that kid, 18 years, 19, what was, George was 19, wasn't he, from, from Kentucky. He finished barber school. And I don't know how I met George. I said, but listen, I need a barber. Why don't you come and work for us, me? He says, yeah, I'm 19 years old, just out of barber college. So anyhow, I got him. And would you believe he's still working there today? Right. He's been with us 41 years. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. You know, you started to tell me about the names of your children. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, Dennis, my twins. Oh, that's what I was going to tell you. Dr. Hesselbrock from Cheviot. Uh-uh, Ben. Uh, no. Uh, Silverton. He had an office in Silverton there, Montgomery Ridge. I cut his hair all the time. Didn't have much hair, but he still paid me 50 or dollar, you know. Mm. We had the babies. I says, damn, Doc, well, how much are you going to charge me? He says, I'll tell you what. I usually charge $100 a head, but being you got two, just make it 100 I said, I'll give you a free haircut then, too. <laughs> so he was my doctor, you see, and Helen's doctor. But anyhow, I cut his hair for oh, it's quite a few years later, and he got sick. I said, damn. So he called me. I said, yeah, I'll be up Kenwood. 
cut his hair at the house, and he looked pretty bad. But he was just a young guy. He couldn't have been more than 60, I bet. But anyhow, he died. But anyhow, that was my Oh, you had a set of twin boys? Yeah, they had twins. Boys? Uh, boy and a girl. Oh, boy and a girl. That was one of them, the barber that just left. Uh -huh. Dennis was Dennis. one of the twins. Yeah. And you had to see his sister, his wife. Uh -huh. About that big round. Dennis about that big round. Right. <laughs> and what was your daughter's name? Teresa, Deborah. Deborah. Deborah? Deborah and Dennis. Okay, that takes care of two. Twins. And then something else happened. I must have got another barber. And Helen got sick. I said, what's the matter with you? She said, I don't know. I don't feel good. So <laughs> then we had number three. See? That was that was Tim. Uh, Timothy? Tim, he's a drug. He sells drugs. <laughs> I call him the drug salesman. Well, he does. He sells drugs. At a drug he's shoot. A drug, and drug company. Uh -huh. But he worked for Procter & Gamble a long time. And he didn't like that. So anyhow, he got into this. But anyhow, Tim come along. So things are going pretty good, you know. We was down there and had that building. And damn, I don't know what happened. She got sick again. Immaculate conception is what it is. It just happened. The Lord God did it. <laughs> but anyhow, then we had Teresa, which is, works for the doctor down the street here. And she's an audiologist. She went to school a little longer and learned to be an Alex. She's hearing, right. speech and hearing. Been there 20 some years. But anyhow, uh, she called a little bit ago. She's so busy, I wanted her to be here because, and Deb, her, her, his wife, she had so much business. She works for some guy in Mary, Marima. What is that? Uh, Madeira. Madeira. A gift shop, is it? Man, beautiful place. All that silverware and all that cut glass and everything. And she being so fancy on big diamond rings and everything, and she fits in there. Been there for years. But Mr. S what's his name? Gilson. Gilson owns a place, and he uh, does all the grinding of the, uh, what's he, oh, he puts the names in this glass. You all mm -hmm. see that? Cuts all these signatures in these cut glass. He's something else. But anyhow, well, then when Teresa come along, Teresa's her name. And damn, she's got a birthday coming up next week. What's she going to be? 43? No. 53. 53. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, my baby. My baby, 53. Well, you know, um, I appreciate all the information and the interview today. Brian, do you have any questions uh, for Gil? Well, I have lots of questions to ask about Pleasant Ridge because I lived there, but that's, that'll be another time. But I, I have a couple of questions about when you were in the military. You said you were in Frankfurt and Nuremberg. Did you see a lot of damage in the cities and things? What, oh, you, yeah. Can you yeah. tell us what you remember about that? Well, that was another thing, yeah. When I got there, as being a farm boy in particular, about, I mean, enjoying building and seeing what bombs can do, I couldn't believe it. All the top of those beautiful buildings blowed off. I thought, man, this is terrible. Why would people want to do this? But that's what happened, yeah. But anyhow, uh, it was hard on me because I coming from the country, I appreciated good things. Then to see man blow them up. Whew. Very true. It was hard. Did you have much interaction with the German citizens like when you were in Germany? Uh, not really. We was kept away from the Germans pretty much to the point where we didn't fraternize, we called it, with the Germans. It wasn't allowed to, but a lot of the guys did fraternize. <laughs> and, uh, but I was only 19, 20 years old. But no, I, uh, no, the Germans, I can't picture much other than hearing them talk. 
I thought how funny that sounds from English, you know. It was quite an experience. Did you find you, did you have a grandfather that was German? Ger what? Was your grandfather from Germany? Yeah, Nuremberg, yeah. Yeah, he was right from where, uh, I almost, I wished I would have had time to uh, find out where Grandpa come from because I probably was right there by it. And that's what I was kidding uh, somebody later on. What am I doing over there fighting the Germans when I'm German? That don't make sense. As a kid, I thought, somebody's crazy. Why would I want to shoot my Germans? And that's where I come from. You know, I'm a German too. <laughs> so that's another st <laughs> the story. That's the way it goes. But yeah, it was quite an experience, I swear to goodness. And I think that today, if only we could put more boys from high school into uh, the armed services for a year, they would be 19 years old. That'd be perfect. You know, our government would take them and put them in for nine, 12 months, six, 12, 13 months. That would do them so much good. And these honorary captains and sergeants, mean sergeants in there would straighten them kids up. Because these kids need some training. They're running loose. Even mom and dad can't do nothing with some of these kids from what I hear on the radio, the tube. Yeah. That's terrible. We never talk back to our parents. If you want to get your hand face slapped, you know. Daddy hit me one time. <laughs> he, shall I quit talking? <laughs> no. Living on this farm that I showed you here, he had an old Ford truck, and Daddy was a stone builder, a rock stone wall builder. But we had a creek right there behind that side of that house I showed you, and we take Daddy take that old truck and down in the creek and put all these poor nice rocks on there and he'd bring them back up and he says I don't know what he did with them well we was building a stone wall at that time at this house I showed you he was building a wall from the house all the way back to the barn about that high but I was only maybe little I was riding a tricycle I know and I was following him down the road there was no traffic down there and it wasn't back in then Anybody went down, we knew it was Bill or Charlie or Frank, you know, right. we knew everybody. But I followed him and he had to make a, he had to back up. And I was back here. And it scared him so bad, he thought he was gonna run over me. Mm -hmm. He come out and hollered at me and hurt my feelings at a point I went home crying. <laughs> yeah. Damn kid, you should never get behind the truck, truck like that. I said, I don't know what I scared said. Scared him to death. Yeah. yeah. Nine, ten years old. Did, um, did you keep in touch much with, since you had, you were a mailman, did you get a lot of letters from home? When I was over there? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. My mom was a good writer. I wish I had some in the day. She was real, well daddy was a good writer. He signed his, I still have a lot of his signatures, letters that he gave me. I got them here, I wanted to show you guys this. He had good handwriting. Daddy took a lot of time to make his E. So I do mine, I'm an E, Edward in the middle. But yeah, there was good penmanship people. How yeah. often were you, were you getting mail from him? Do you remember? Was it? Oh, mom was pretty good at writing every, every month at least, yeah. Every month she would always write and it would take a long time to get there on the boat, you know. And But yeah. But some of those guys, they got pretty regular. Me being a mailman, this I would come get the mail in these big, big bags, mail bags. They still use them with that big zipper on the top or that big draw rope. Go to the mailbox, go to the mail post office, pick them up, bring them down to the place where we lived. Dump it out, dump the mail out. And some of these moms would take a shoebox, a shoebox, excuse me, shoebox, and bake cookies and everything. And they'd mail, mail, can you imagine mailing that into a mail that was thrown from that ship to that ship to right. that truck? Yeah. When it got to me, I just had to laugh. You open that up and just dump it out. It was all crumbs. Right. <laughs> right. And the guys would say, did you get a box? I said, you mean this box? All it has is an empty cardboard box. Well, where's the cookies? I said, you tell me. I said, tell mom. She can't send cookies over here, it just don't hold up. <laughs>
Well, were you in Germany when, when FDR died? Do you remember hearing about that? Yeah, I think I was. Did he die in 40? He died in 45 at the end of the war. April the 12th. Oh, no, I was home then, I guess. Because I was home in 45, wasn't I? So, spring, I think you got came back to the States in the fall. Right. Oh. I was wondering if you ever remember, like, when Hitler committed suicide or where you were when you heard about that. Any, any memories about that? Or much. when the war was over? Was oh, when the war, of course. Yeah, that was a big deal. We was all looking forward to that. But I uh, can't think where I was at the end of the war. Oh, I was in, on the boat, wasn't I? Well, for Japan. I was wondering when, when, when fighting hmm. ended in, in uh, Europe. Yeah. If you remember where you were or anything. Yeah, we was in... Uh, yeah. We was at an air base someplace in Belgium, I think, when the war ended. And that's when we were, this was, what they call it, must, uh, mustard out or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, no, I didn't get discharged till I was home or did I? Yeah. Right. And yeah. I just have one last question. Did you keep in touch with many of those guys that you served with? Oh, I used to before they died on me. Uh, this guy from Dayton, Ohio, little George. Yeah, and our first sergeant, or uh-uh. He was a staff sergeant. He was the bookkeeper. He mm -hmm. did all that. He was only about that big. Hell of a nigga. Boy, he was sharp. But, yeah, I went to Dayton and saw them. Helen and I used to go up there, and uh, they used to feed us and you know we had a good time but since that uh, kind of got away from them yeah but they're all gone now everybody's dead as far as I know because I was the youngest and they was older than me so I'm sure if I'm 90 they got to be dead well <laughs> so that's the way it was yep yeah. all right well thank you you're well, welcome thanks uh, a lot Gil I want to thank you for uh, sharing your experiences with yeah, us gee thanks and a lot we appreciate it so much yeah, I'm glad you got to do it, and that we will be. Uh, oh, Helen. Yes, I'm going to get.